In this video, we'll be hearing from filmmaker Ava DuVernay and gaining some insight on how she approaches filmmaking. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, I'm Juliana and this is Juliana Talks Films, the channel where I explore and examine films and filmmakers. If you love films and filmmaking, consider subscribing for weekly videos. In the last few years, Ava DuVernay has wedged her way into Hollywood mainstream and made a name for herself as a director. The LA native actually began her career in entertainment public relations, opening her first PR agency at the ripe age of 27. It wasn't until her mid-30s that she transitioned into filmmaking by financing a handful of shorts, documentaries, and her first narrative feature film, I Will Follow, with her own money. Since her humble beginnings, she's gone on to win the directing award at the 2012 Sundance Film Festival, has become the first black woman to be nominated for a Best Director Golden Globe, and is also the first black female director to be nominated for the Academy Award for Best Picture. Ava is a self-aware, charismatic filmmaker who bases her work on common themes of perseverance, determination, and courage. Her more recognizable films explore socio-political narratives that at their core deal with oppression in some form or another. Now before we get started, I want to hear from you guys. What other filmmakers do you want to see and hear from in future videos? Leave me a comment below and let me know. With that, here's my take on Ava DuVernay's five lessons on filmmaking. You know what, I just make what I'm interested in at any particular time. And, um, and it's because it's really hard to make a movie. It is, um, it's like a two, three year process. And you're really married to it. I call these films my children because I don't have um, physical children and um, for a reason. And, um, and this is what I'll leave behind. This is what my name is on. And so uh, this is what will be said of me afterwards. So I put a lot of time, a lot of focus into it. And so why do that for something that you don't care about? Yeah. Um, so for me, I'm not kind of a director for hire. I have to be living and breathing the material. But also just even more, for me, the... I just am a film lover, and for me, it really go goes beyond the idea of cinema. It goes into the idea of the image. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason why we use the term your mind's eye. You know, we, we think and remember in images, in pictures, right? And so film is just an artificial rendering of what's actually inside here. You know what I mean? It's a little different than music. It's a di little different than, you know, than, than, than even sculpture. You're, we're recreating life in cinema. We're recreating stories that you remember, things that you're tapping into, things that really seep into your DNA and become a part of you. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the power of images, it's been used to distort and malnourish, but it also can be used to, um, to nourish and to grow us. And so that's um, what I'm looking for whenever I start a project. So when I put all this on and I go out on set, I, I am who I feel I should be. And I'm only able to be that because I took off something three years ago in 2010 that was inhibiting me from being that. And that was my desperation. So I wore my desperation like a coat. Like it was definitely the first thing you saw when you met me because it was draped over everything I said, everything I felt, everything I thought, everything I did. It had to be the first thing you saw when you met me because it's the first thing I see when I meet a lot of people, right? in a tweet, in an email, after a q and I see just this heavy coat of sinking, desperate to get whatever it is you're trying to make made. Um, I was desperate, I was sitting right there. Um, and I think for a while you're in info gathering mode, right? You come to these gatherings and you're trying to figure out, am I interested in this? Can I do this? What is this about? What, are, you know, what, what is this whole independent film thing? How do I get it done? And that's the cool part of it. But when it tips over into the part that you say, I want to do this, you get into a dangerous area. Because you can miscalculate what you're giving out. And that becomes the death nail in the way that people are responding to you. So let me try to explain that a little bit more. Um, during that time when I was very desperate, acting in a desperate manner, I needed help to proceed, right? I needed a break, I needed to nail the pitch, I needed someone to say yes. I needed a mentor, I needed a green light, I needed access, I needed the secret password, I needed a rich uncle, I needed everything I didn't have so that I could make my movie and tell my story. And that 
desperation. It was like an emotional pain that I was carrying. I, I mean, literally, it was the first thing. I could be saying words like, yeah, I've written the script and whatever I'm saying, I, I've applied to this lab or whatever, but it was coming out in a way that was not from a place of empowerment. And that's the difference. And during that time, I was feeling like, this is so big what I want to do. It's so big what you all want to do or what you're doing. And the odds are against you. I mean, the odds were so against me, doubly so. Um, being black, being a woman, never having gone to film school, not having access, not having a rich uncle, not having any of the things that I thought I needed, I wanted, or that I thought I deserved at that time. And it was the first thing that I know people saw when they met me. And I really meet people where it's not the first thing that I see, that, that I can tell the desperation, desperation is there. Because I rarely meet people who tell me what they're doing. I often meet people who ask, can you help me? Or how do I do this? Or, or the following. Do you want to have coffee? Can I take you to coffee? Can, we, can, can I grab a coffee? I'd love to take you to coffee. Just pick your brain a little bit. Uh, can I send you a script? Can you read my script? I have a script that I'd love for you to just check out when you can. Can you be my mentor? I really need a mentor. Uh, I mean, I, I would love if you could mentor me. I, 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 is it possible for us to talk? Can you? All that energy, all of that focus on trying to extract from other people is preventing you from doing. All of that other is desperation. I don't know if that makes sense. But when I figured that out, things started to change for me. When I'm meeting people one-on-one -on -one and they're coming up to me and I'm feeling the desperation, I can't say to them in that moment what I'm about to say to you right now because it would be rude. But we're all here and we're safe, so I'm going to say it. Knock it off because it doesn't work. It's never going to work for you. That feeling of, I need help, I need all these things to proceed. And when I got that, a revolution happened for me, and that's when things started to change. I'm saying this because I was in that, that same place. All of the time you're spending trying to get someone to mentor you, trying to have a coffee, trying to I don't know, all of the things that we try to do to move ahead in the industry. It's time that you're not working on your screenplay, strengthening your character arcs, thinking about your rehearsal techniques, setting up a table read to hear the words, thinking about symbolism in your production design, your color palette. All the time you're focusing on trying to grab, I need this, I need this, I don't have this. You're being desperate and you're not doing. You have to be doing something. Desperation, all that stuff is not active. It's not doing anything. It's not moving you forward because all of the so-called action is hinging on someone doing something for you. Does that make sense? I mean, I look at um, the careers of people I admire because unfortunately there's no black woman's career that has the consistency and longevity that I aim to have. Yeah. I can look at, um, I can look at beautiful, exquisite black women filmmakers and the films that they've made. Julie Dash, who's a mentor and goddess to me. But even she would say, you know, her, her, she has not had the opportunity and the space and the access to have the kind of career that she should have and deserved to have. Mm. So I can't call her to ask her how to deal with this studio or this agent or this deal or this day on the set when you know right. you needed you know three cranes and only two showed up, but you got to get the shot because there's not another day. Like there's no one to 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 call about. You know you're having a problem with an actor, which I never have problems with actors, but you're having a problem or anything like that. There there was no one to call for me. There's also no one to look at to say I want her career. Mm -hmm. Not even a non-black woman. I can't say there's a woman that I can look at and say, I want her career. I love the films that they've made, but I want to <laughs> make films and t like, I want to be an old lady calling ca action and cut. Like, uh, I, I, I really do. Like, I look at Agnes Varda, um, you know, but I'm saying an American woman filmmaker 
certainly of color, certain, certainly black. So I have to look to the careers of, of Caucasian men um, whose work I admire. So I look at, let's take Spielberg, um, who can do Jaws, E.T., Close Encounters, and he's doing all these kind of in a fantasy space or in a, in a, in a what do you, you call Jaws? Like, <laughs> so I, you know, yeah, like it, it, it may not be real, like a hyper real kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then go do Schindler's List. And I went back and looked, it was like, what were they saying during that time? They weren't just like, yeah, do Schindler's List. You know, yes, you can do it. They were, they were you know, mm -hmm. he went to do Color Purple. Um, they were like, what? You're doing Color Purple? And black people were like, what? You're doing Color Purple? And white <laughs> folks were like, what? You're doing Color Purple? <laughs> and he did it, you know, uh, to great. If you study, uh, study around that time, and all that happened around the Color Purple. So I see him as someone whose career I look at and say, wow, what a career. And almost every filmmaker looks at him and says, what a career he's been able to have. And I see risk. You know, I see taking risks. Everything he did it hasn't, didn't work. You go through his filmography and I was like, what's that? What's, did he have a film called Always? Or like, uh, uh, from something about people that were flying a plane? Or I don't know. Uh, the la you know, it, it, you look at Scorsese, you see some things that, 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 that when did that come out? I don't remember it. Like they might, it might have come and gone. I look at Ridley Scott. You know, I mean, for as many hits, you've also got what the industry would call misses. Mm -hmm. I look at Denis Villeneuve, who did Blade Runner. You know, put his heart into that film. It didn't open, didn't do a number. Um, and, you know, he steps out and instead of, I don't know, he could go in and doing something that was a surefire, I don't know, James Bond or whatever, he goes in and says, I'm gonna try it again and do Dune, mm. right? Which is like, I was like, my man, it's like the same. <laughs> You're gonna, and he's like, yeah, I really want, okay, all right. <laughs> Risk, you know? And so I feel like um, I can continue to do the intimate drama ar around issues that are really important to me, which I will continue to do. Mm -hmm. But in there, I, I, I wanna spice it up and take some risks. And, um, and I do that, you know, in a very deliberate um, mimicking of what I've seen directors do who've had the careers that I want and so that the next black woman or brown woman or native woman or Filipino woman or whoever that comes up can call me and I'll be able to share what I've learned, what worked and what didn't work. Uh, but I think at the core of it, it's stretching and getting out of your boxes and creating those worlds in any place that you can. And so when Disney said, come, come do this, um, I was about it. I remember I was on one that day. I was like, what was I thinking? I was thinking all kinds. Sometimes you're just on it. Your mind just goes wild that day. People quote that back to me. I was like, what was I saying? Um, I was like, what was I thinking that day? But I think I'm always trying to interrogate this idea of what our art does once it's received by audience. I'm always thinking about that relationship between what I make and what the audience receives. And the Great. What I love most is the fact that I have no clue what people are going to get out of what I make. I always get the question, what? <laughs> always get the same question at the end of it, at the end of an interview or Q and A. What would you like people to know and take from your work? And I always get the same answer. I, I don't want them to think or take anything for, that I decide for them. I want them to take what they will and think what they will. And if I can just, if they take away anything or are activated to think about anything I've won and, I've, and I'm a success, right? But I don't want to prescribe or dictate what that is by giving it meaning and saying this is what this means. And so in thinking about my relationship between my art making and my art practice and the audience, um, I, 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 I really feel like it's a lens. If I put a certain lens on a camera, if I put a 35 or a, or a, or a, or if I'm on a, a lens that's a 100 millimeter lens, if I put these different lenses on, whatever I'm looking at, it, it, it changes, right? So I make those decisions and I put them all in the film. But each audience member has their own lens, their own experience, their own family memories. What your husband said this morning, the fact that your, your pants are too tight and you just wish you wore the other ones. Whatever, whatever you're coming into the seat with is all a part of the lens that you're using to process what I've made on any given day. And those images, as they come into your mind's eye, become a part of your bloodstream, your memory, your DNA, right? 
haven't you watched something one day and then watched a year later and be like, oh, I like it now, or I hated it then, or I thought I hated that film, but it was really good, or I love this film, and then you watch it and you think, that film is stupid, right? And so it's just the moment that you see it, that you take it in, it, it becomes internalized, it becomes a part of you. That relationship is something that I continue to struggle with because um, I, you have to let the art go. Right? So when I, while I always say, oh, I don't want to, you know, dictate meaning or put any meaning on a thing, I have to wrestle away this idea of what my art means every single time I make something, right? And I have to really understand that people are processing it in their own way from where they are at any given moment. Everyone watching 13th is not going to agree. They don't even see black people as people. They don't understand that prison, prison is just a place where bad people go. So there's nothing that I can say that's going to get through that. And I have to let go of that and really let the art be a true offering. And that's a constant reworking of my relationship with audience. As much as I can say, oh, I don't give meaning, I don't want to say what I want people to think, it's a cute answer for a different, deeper untethering to my own work that I think I, I've been trying to process, and I just encourage other artists to do. It's helpful, it's like when you get the bad review or the person that just takes out their cell phone in the middle of the ballet, I'm sure it's happened to you, I don't know, right? <laughs> you just, you know, it's like, are you doing that now? Is this happening? It's about, look, I'm gonna offer this to you, that painting, that, 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 that sculpture, this, this, this dance, this, this film to you, and it's only in the offering that what I do matters. It's not in the way that, it's even received. Does so that make any so sense? That, yeah, it makes total sense. But is that to say that that tension of rigor that you apply in the making of the art is relaxed in the, in the, once the gift it has, has been to be. given? That's and that's where the challenge is. If you're so rigorous, if you're so disciplined, so focused on the making, which as makers and as artists we are, and, and then even further, as a filmmaker, I have to be completely immersed in the marketing of the piece, right? Because that is important as well for me to go cut through the clutter of everything else that's in Times Square, right? So that you really know that A Wrinkle in Time is coming on March 9th. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just what we have to do. Then, then, then I gotta let it go on March 9th. You, you know what I mean? I really, you have to turn that corner. And it's something that I really, really, my goal, I don't know how long it'll take, it may be my whole career, um, but I hope I get the opportunity to, to practice this much more. There's a moment where you really, really have to let it go. I've seen the pain, I was a publicist before I was a filmmaker, the pain that artists go through in the reception. And I've talked to a lot of artists that say, but that's what art is. It's the receipt by the audience, right? And I get it, it is true. I just have to know that I delivered it properly with everything that I had, and I made sure, even in the marketing policy, that I got to you. I, I can give it to her, I put it on, give it to her on a silver platter, however I can get it to her, but what she thinks, I, I can't control, I can't mourn, and I can't celebrate too much, right? I have to stay in a middle place so that I can stay free enough to go to the next. A lot of people laud me for being the first black woman director to do this and that, but um, you know, it's, it's uh, bittersweet if I walk on a set and I'm the only one. Yeah. Uh, and so it's important for me to not just bring a few people along. I'm talking parity. I'm talking equal amounts of men and women. I'm talking about fully integrated crews with all kinds of people. And the refrain that we continue to hear is, oh, we can't find them. I was like, well, there's a, there's a scenic painter. I just want to talk about this. I I'm obsessed yeah. with the scenic painter. The scenic painter is the coolest job, okay? <laughs> There's so many cool jobs on a film set, but the scenic painter is the painter that comes in and makes the wall, and when they see us in the houses, even though it was on a stage and we just put up the wall, look old, like look like it has been, that the people have been living in it for 16 years, right? Putting a little Jerry Curl juice on the, you know, just a little <laughs> bit of it, putting a little, little, little bit of the, <laughs> little bit of whatever the, the mother was frying chicken, you know how sometimes the grease like just kind of collects, like all of those things, and the scenic painter is in, uh, in charge of making a white wall look like a lived-in wall. It's a painter who's ours. You telling me there's no graffiti artists out there that can make $100 an hour being a scenic painter? And doesn't right? know what Greece looked like. Doesn't even know, right. But doesn't even know that that job exists, doesn't know that it's a union, doesn't know that it's a real job, it's a career job, it's a beautiful job. So part of what we're doing with um, one of our initiatives is just trying to educate people to all the jobs that are possible and educate our industry to the fact that there are people of color and women of all kinds who can do that job. We have to think of it in a different way and make those connections. Because the main thing is, well, I can't find any 
any, anybody to do the job. And so we're trying to create those pathways. I always say, and I really believe this, if your dream only includes you, it's too small, you know? It, I mean, it's, it's, it's fine, it's cool, it'll be good for you, and may, that might be the size that you want, but if you want to be enlarged, yeah. um, you gotta be doing something for more than just yourself. I think everybody here knows that. My favorite personal piece of advice is to stop asking for permission and start focusing on building your dream. What about you guys? What nugget of wisdom will you take with you on your filmmaking journey? Leave me a comment below and let me know. And if you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with someone who might also find it helpful. Thank you all so much for watching. And as a bonus for sticking all the way through to the end of the video, here's a bonus tip for you as well. Enjoy. I mean, making a film is hard. I mean, you know, some of you in here have done it or are trying to do it. It is, uh, I mean, you know, two nights ago, I mean, Jane's shaking her head. I mean, I was just in the, the sound mix. Just dr I had a sound mix going, mm. a VFX session going. Uh, uh, the composer was in the other room. The editor's in the room. It's three in How the How many morning. hours? Three in the... I mean, we're... Were you working seven, at that point? Seven all... I mean, when I say seven all-nighters, that means go home, take a shower, you like, get a quick meal, maybe two hours, and go and back. And go right back. It, because right. we were on a crazy deadline. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's too hard. The way that I make films, it's too hard to do something that you don't you, love if, if you ain't in it. If there's something that you don't right. love in it, right. it's just there's just no amount of money. Like, for example, on this this piece that I was doing, this pilot, uh, I'm on set. I'm feeling good. I'm really, I, I really like this piece. There's something in the piece that I want to say. I, there's something in this piece that I want to be on television. It's about this elite group of uh, of. Uh, uh, freedom fighters. They work for the DOJ and they're a combination of lawyers and FBI agents and every week they solve a different civil rights abuse. So it's like every week the country would be able to see a, a case solved about anti-Muslim sentiment or a case solved that something around Ferguson or a mm. case solved that something <clears throat> around a transgender murder or whatever. But mm. these elements in the, 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 the umbrella of a procedural, um, you're actually able to give middle America or whomever's watching some information about people on the outside, people on the margins, right? And so I love the idea of that. But at the point that it's two in the morning, I'm in New York in a snowstorm doing a night exterior, I'm thinking, there's no amount of money. Right, 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 right. Like, where's Jane? I need a raise. You know right. what I mean? Like right. this, right. this, why am I here? What, and so, and what the answer was is because I have to tell the story, but if the answer was, because you need a check, there's no amount of money to do something you don't want to do. So, um, so yeah. Did I hear that, students? I, I'm used to not having. I'm used to not having a lot of money. So, right. and you know, making right. stuff indie. So, yeah. you know, I mean, what, what do you really need? Mm -hmm.